Well, think about a great story you last heard. Maybe it was in a movie, maybe in a book that you read, maybe a friend told you a, a really cool story. Something about that story might have, might have stuck with you, might have resonated with you, might have echoed in your heart, because there's something about stories. Stories hit us different than facts or a, a list of advice. There's something special about stories. Now, you know, God speaks through stories. The, the Bible is a collection of stories, stories of faith, stories of failure, but all stories that point us towards God and towards the purposes that he has for us. Now, I'm going to share with you all a story here over these next few minutes, a story that will hopefully encourage and inspire you towards more and more courageous faith, no matter where you're at on your journey. I'm going to take you back a few years. I was a student at the University of Southern California out in Los Angeles, just trying to find my way through college. Uh, I stumbled through four different majors my freshman year and finally landed at, at journalism. To, it was going to be my major, and I was going to go be a sports reporter because I wanted to get as close as I could to sports. Um, since I obviously couldn't play, I was way too small and, and played, just couldn't, <laughs> there was no chance of me playing in college. So I was going to be a sports reporter and, and uh, get as close as I could to sports. So there is my... Journalism degree started to, to take, take off there during college. Part of the assignment for a journalism major was you had to go write for the school newspaper, the Daily Trojan. And so there I get assigned to cover women's volleyball, and I'm out covering the women's volleyball team. And about two weeks later, the sports editor calls and says, hey, we've got to change you, change you out of the women's volleyball beat. And I thought, well, I already messed this one up, so <laughs> I've got to move on to another sport already. I, I, I can't even handle this. And he's like, no, actually, we want to kind of elevate you, and we want you to cover the football team. This was the mid-2000s when USC was kind of the dominant force in, in college football. Matt Leiner, Reggie Bush, Heisman trophies, national championships. This was the glory years for USC football. So I jumped at the opportunity, and for the next three years, my job in college was to cover the football team at USC. Went to every single home and away game for three straight years. I went to two Heisman trophy ceremonies, three national championship football games. I was living a dream. This was the greatest opportunity of a lifetime. I found my dream job, and I hadn't even graduated college yet. This was so cool. So there I was, gearing up three years later to graduate. I was looking for my last article to write about the football team. And uh, spring being graduation season, springtime's not really ripe for football stories, obviously being an off-season and whatnot. But I saw that there was a walk-on tryout coming up for the football team. Now, for those of you that, that aren't familiar, walk-ons are kind of the end of the bench guys. A, a football team in college is made up of 85 scholarship players, and then there's about 15 to, to 20 walk-ons on the team, guys that have to pay their own way to go to college, pay for their own room and board, and everything in between. And, but they help fill out the team. They help kind of be the practice squad on the team. And I, I figured, well, why don't I write about who's, who's showing up at this walk-on tryout? Any student at USC could try out, so I figured... Let's see what guys are showing up to this. So I'm interviewing some of the guys that are preparing for this walk-on tryout, and the tryout's coming up, and it hits me in that moment. Well, what if I kind of take it a step further and go through the tryout myself? Kind of first-person perspective, really show people what this is really like. For those of you that, that might have a little bit more gray hair than the rest of us, you, you might think of George Plimpton, potentially. Um, but just try to bring people on the inside. You just try to show people how hard this was. And so... I go and uh, show up at the walk-on tryout. Um, you can tell I don't look like a football player. Uh, at the time, I was 160 pounds. Um, this was the number one team in the country. Uh, they had just come off of winning two of the last three championships. Um, and on top of that, the last time I played football was in fifth grade. So this was going to be a total joke. I was going to be the sports reporter for the, the school newspaper, going through the tryout kind of make fun of myself, show how hard this was to, to go through a tryout. And this is going to be my last article before I graduated. So I go through the tryout. I'm running a 40-yard dash for the first time in my life. I'm running routes to wide receiver for the first time in my life. And I get through the tryout, and I had the experience of a lifetime. This was going to be the greatest article. This was a gold mine. So I go home that night. I start writing my story. I, I couldn't wait to turn it in the next day and, and, and kind of see what happens with that article. And the next morning, I get a phone call really early in the morning. It was like 9 a.m. for a college student, so it was very early. I get a phone call uh, saying, hey, is this Ben Malcolmson? And uh, I was like, yes. And she's like, congratulations, you made the football team. <laughs> I, I laughed too, so um, 
I was like, okay, haha, funny, good joke, who is this? And she's like, no, 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 your name's on the list. You made the football team, congratulations. So my heart dropped in that moment. I hopped on my bike, pedaled as fast as I could over the football building to confirm that this wasn't some prank by one of my friends or something. And I'm pedaling there and it hits me like a ton of bricks that like Pete Carroll, he was head coach of USC at the time, was the Seahawks head coach for the last 15 years or whatnot. Um, but at the time he was USC's head coach and he's renowned for pulling pranks. He's a kid at heart. You could go on YouTube right now, type in Pete Carroll prank. Well, don't do it right now, but um, <laughs> after the service, type in Pete Carroll prank and there'll be a dozen pranks that show up there on YouTube. So I'm like, oh man, like what better but of the latest prank of Coach Carroll than the student newspaper reporter who went through the walk-on trial to write an article. So there I am trudging my way up to the football building fully expecting, you know, Will Ferrell, Snoop Dogg are going to be there. There's going to be ESPN cameras. They're going to point and laugh at me when I walk up, and I'll be on YouTube that night, everyone laughing at me. So I walk up the stairs of the football building and walk into the football office, and there's Coach Carroll with a big old grin on his face. And I was like, Coach, good prank. Nice job. And he's like, what are you talking about? You can catch the ball. You can run fast. We want you on the team. Are you in? And there in that moment, my life took a total turn. I went from a student newspaper reporter who was a month from graduating to all of a sudden a wide receiver on the number one football team in the country, having not played football since fifth grade, having gone through the, the tryout just to write an article for the school newspaper. So there I, I go down to the equipment room, they hand me my helmet and my pads. I didn't know what, which way was front and back on the pads. Um, <laughs> I get my playbook handed to me. The wide receiver coach at the time was Lane Kiffin, who's now Ole Miss head coach, hands me the playbook and I open the playbook and he's like, it's a lot different than Madden, huh? I'm like, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a, a lot more complex of a playbook there. So there I am uh, at spring practice. I just get thrown into the wolves, and I'm uh, out as a sacrificial lamb, basically, as a <laughs> tackling dummy for this team ended up having 53 guys that would go on and play in the NFL. So this team was an NFL roster, essentially. And uh, I was out just taking hits at practice, and I'm about a month into practice. Um, I'd started to understand the playbook, I'd started to work out a lot, um, started to gain some weight, started to go to Taco Bell every night, that really helped, <laughs> and uh, was starting to look and think and feel like a football player, at least a little bit more than I did a month earlier. And I'm out blocking a cornerback on a play, and my hand gets caught in his pads, we get tangled up, and all of a sudden I'm lying on my back and my shoulder's dislocated. The trainers rush out on the field, put it back in, send me to the hospital there on campus, and the, the doctor there is like, hey, I know you, you didn't ha really have much of a football career, but it's, it's over. Um, so this requires reconstruct reconstructive surgery. Your shoulder's blown up. Um, you're going to need to get surgery right away, and, and whatever hope you had of playing football, it's gone. So uh, let's, let's get, get, get the surgery scheduled and move on with life. So I go through the surgery, um, obviously defeated and, and discouraged because I thought I had this new life. You know, I thought I had this one season to play football on this team. And uh, for whatever reason, I just devoted myself to the rehab process. And for the next couple months, just poured myself into that rehab process. And about four and a half months after the surgery, um, just went in for a regular checkup. And the doctor goes through and he's like, so your surgery was about, what, nine, 12 months ago? And I was like, no, it was four months ago. He's like, no, 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 it's impossible. Let me check my notes. And he, he's like, wait, you're right. I've never seen someone heal this fast. You're completely healed. You can go back to playing football. This was week one of the regular season. It was a miracle. So there I am, all of a sudden, back on the football team. And I'm out practicing again and uh, getting lit up on the practice field, getting a lot of concussions probably, but we don't need to talk about that. Um, <laughs> And I'm, I'm just happy to be back on the team, back being a part of the practice squad and, and being a part of something that was really special. And in that process, I was just content to, to be a part of the Monday through Friday and then suit up on game days, run out of the tunnel and cheer on my teammates. Because as I said, this team was stacked. I, they didn't need a scrub like me to play. So my, my only hope of contributing was really just suiting up in the, the practice uniform and that's it. But there was a group of students that had greater dreams than that. They started a campaign called Get Ben In. They, <laughs> they wanted to see kind of the average student get into a game and uh, kind of cheer for that. So they put up posters all around campus, they made t-shirts, they got on college game day, and they started chants in the student section every home game, Get Ben In. It was kind of awkward because 
I was the last guy on the bench. Um, didn't really deserve to play. Um, but it was kind of cool, too, because, I mean, here the student section's chanting and, and whatnot. We make it through all the way through the whole season, and, and no chance of me playing. We make it to our last home game of the year against Notre Dame. Uh, it's number three USC versus number five Notre Dame, a, 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 an epic matchup in the Coliseum in L.A. So, I mean, chances of me playing, I mean, we, we'd have to be up by about 100 points for me to get into a game. So <laughs> very slim chances of this whole Get Ben In campaign uh, becoming a, a reality. So Fox Sports did a little documentary. We're going to show a little three-minute clip here to kind of tell the rest of this part of the story. So if we could tee that up. Arch rival Notre Dame was USC's final opponent of the year and Ben's last chance to play for the Trojans. I got up in the morning at the hotel and was watching the television and I saw a big sign and it said, get Ben in with a big photo of Ben on it. I'm thinking, this is remarkable. It was so cool how people rally behind me. 92,000 people and all very feverish because it was the Notre Dame game. It was spine tingling. If I could have just taken that as my last seat memory, that would have been the best thing ever. This is my last chance. It was senior night at the Coliseum. We were asked as a group of parents to come out on the field and form a gauntlet for the players to run through. And of course, the first name they mentioned. He comes running through like Traveler the Horse, and he ran through the gauntlet. I look up on the Jumbotron, and there it is. It says Ben Malcolmson from Highland Park, Texas. And I went, oh my gosh. Many people tell me I'd give my left arm to have that experience. And I go, wow, it really is that big a deal. The Notre Dame game couldn't have been a more storied way to end. After all, Notre Dame's Rudy Rudiger's walk-on story had inspired a feature film, Rudy almost like it was divine intervention. We were up two scores. I remember that Notre Dame had tried to onside kick the ball. The Trojans have finally got it. They're going to take off for the end zone, and here comes Brian Cushing. Touchdown! The score then got to a point where there was a sufficient spread that the coaches felt comfortable in putting Ben in the game. Finally, eight months of sweat, pain, and dedication paid off for Ben Malcolmson. It was an out-of-body experience for sure. Coach said, Benny, you're in. We saw him running out there, and we said, oh my gosh, he's actually going to get into the game. It was just an awesome experience. Um, I definitely went nuts. Even though it was only like 10 seconds of me on the field on that play, it meant so much to me for all the work that I put in, all the challenges to overcome but also for the people who had started to support me. And it was just not only my friends, it was so many people around campus, people in class, people I didn't even know. What a remarkable experience. And uh, I think that's what Ben kind of lived for. Though he was only on the field for one play, Ben accomplished something few could ever imagine. That dream that everyone has to what would it be like to be out there and be a part of it, he got to live it. For Ben to be able to do that was something that I think really proved to him that I can do something extraordinary in my life. It is very special for these guys to be able to hang in this program. It's a very unique program. That's a lifelong memory for those guys to make it through because of their will and their toughness and their desire and the way they dream. It's a beautiful thing sometimes. It's just surreal. It's unbelievable. It seems like only stuff that happens in movies. It's one of the highest moments of my life, without a doubt. Well, uh, I don't want you to clap too much. I do need to come clean on something. I actually lined up wrong on the play and should have been penalized five yards. So, <laughs> Thankfully, the refs let that one slide. That would have been an embarrassing entry into the scorebook there. But uh, I mentioned at the beginning, God speaks through stories. Maybe that story gives you a little exciting inspiration there, but really there was something even deeper going on through that whole season. So when I made the team, I felt this overwhelming sense that God had me there for a purpose. It wasn't the audible voice of God, but it was kind of a nudge on my heart that God had put me on that team for a reason. And so I was pressing into it from day one. I saw that there wasn't a Bible study for our team, so I 
got a Bible study ready and I prepared a lesson. I put up flyers all over the locker room. I got a room ready and time comes for our first Bible study and no one shows up. So it took me a little while to get through that discouragement because I thought God put me on that team for a purpose. He put me on that team for a reason, but I just failed. So then I get another idea. I'll start a prayer group for the team. We'll gather together as a team and, and pray together before every game. Pass flyers around our, our locker room, get a room ready for our first prayer meeting. Time comes, no one shows up. So now I'm twice as discouraged, twice as defeated, and doubting even more, maybe God doesn't have a purpose for me here. Then I was reading in Matthew 5, 16 one time, and it said, let your light shine before others so that God may see your good works, see your good de- so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And when, that, when I read that, it hit me. I was trying to create something. I was trying to create some event or something like that, but really what God was calling me to do was just to be a light in, in this team, on this team here. So there I went for the next several weeks. I was so excited. That was my purpose on this team. I was going to be a light, and God was going to reveal his purpose to me there in that moment. And weeks and weeks and weeks go by, and I'm trying to be a light, trying to have an impact, trying to find my purpose. Nothing's happening. There's no results. So here I am, not only discouraged and defeated even more, but I'm also running out of time. I only had that one season to play on the team, and the clock was ticking. The season was winding down. Then one morning, towards the end of the season, I was reading in Isaiah 55, and it says, if his word goes out, It will not return empty, but it will accomplish what God desires and achieve the purpose for which he sends it. And so it hit me there in that moment, okay, I need to to get the word out there. And being a very literal 21-year-old, I was like, I need to get a Bible inside the locker of every single one of my teammates. I called my grandfather. He volunteered with the Gideon's organization. They, they volunteer all over the world, pass out Bibles. If you go to a hotel room, open the top drawer, it's most likely a Gideon Bible in there. Share this idea with him. I want to pass out Bibles to all of my teammates. He's like, great idea. I'll send you 100 Bibles. So I get a box of 100 Bibles, and this is right before Christmas. And I figure, okay, I'll make this kind of a Christmas gift. And so I typed up a little red note, placed it inside every single Bible. Christmas gift for you the greatest present you will ever receive, Jesus Christ, Merry Christmas. And I went in middle of the night on Christmas Eve and I placed a Bible inside every single one of my teammates' lockers. This was the purpose God had for me on that team. I was so sure of it. I was so excited to see what God was gonna do through this. And we had Christmas Day off and on the 26th of December, we were coming back together as a team for our last week together before playing in the Rose Bowl that week on New Year's Day. Now, I couldn't wait to get there on the morning of the 26th because this was God's purpose for me. He had brought me through all those failures to get to this moment because if his word goes out, it will not return empty. Now, I was walking up to the locker room that morning thinking, I mean, is a gold light going to be emanating from the locker room? Like, are my teammates going to be singing the hallelujah chorus as I walk in? I mean, this was going to be amazing. I walk in. The Bibles were thrown all over the ground, ripped up, shredded. Couldn't even see the carpet of the locker room because all you could see were shredded pages of the Bibles. I was utterly defeated and discouraged. So I trudged through the rest of that week just kind of assuming that I had missed my purpose, that God had put me on that team and I must have just completely missed it. We play in the Rose Bowl and and win the game. It was really exciting from a football perspective, but I had this hole in my heart that I had missed why God had put me on that team. A couple days after the Rose Bowl, I get a call from a teammate saying, hey, did you hear about Mario? Mario was our kicker on the team, record-setting kicker at USC, one of my closest friends on the team, and basically like kind of the mayor of the team. He was like the most lovable guy on the team. Everyone loved him. And I was like, oh, no, what happened to Mario? He's like, oh, no, you didn't hear. Mario died last night. Just a couple days after our last game together, Mario tragically, mysteriously passes away. So now, not only am I dealing with discouragement and failing to find my purpose, but now I'm dealing with death and grief of losing a friend and a teammate. And on top of that, at that point, his eternal fate was sealed. And I had a chance to impact it, 
and I completely failed. Sure, I invited him to all those things, and I put a Bible in his locker, but obviously none of those things worked. So I'm carrying this grief and this discouragement. And as we go to his funeral a few days later, we're stuffed in these pews in this tiny little church, and this casket passes by, and on top of his casket was this Bible with a red note sticking out of it. And I had no idea what it meant, but it just felt like it was God's personal touch to kind of comfort me in that moment. It was like God had seen me through all those steps of failure, through seeing a friend pass away, and it was like God's little personal touch for me. So I ended up working at USC from there and worked there for three years. Coach Carroll took the job with the Seattle Seahawks in 2010, asked me to move up to Seattle to work for him up there. I moved up to Seattle, just excited for a new adventure and trying to make some friends outside of work. And I hear about this group called Young Life. And they have a high school mentorship program. They were super involved in a handful of high schools in the Seattle area, and they needed some volunteer leaders. So I show up at this informational meeting for volunteer leaders and just trying to find something to do outside of work and uh, learn about this whole opportunity. And a former teammate of mine walks through the door. His name was Taylor. He was our punter on the team. And my heart dropped when I saw Taylor. I hadn't seen him since Mario's funeral four years earlier. I didn't know he lived in Seattle. He didn't know I lived up there. So we kind of removed ourselves from this meeting. We're catching up. And as we're catching up, I'm like, something's different about this guy. He's different than the way he was when we were on the team. I don't want to be judgy or anything, but he just felt like something was different about him. And he's like, dude, the last few years, my life has totally turned around. I was like, well, what happened? He's like, do you remember that last week we were on the team together, there were Bibles in all of our lockers? Now, my heart dropped. I I hadn't really thought about that Bible since seeing it on top of Mario's casket four years earlier. So for some reason, I just played dumb. I was like, yeah, I kind of remember those. Not really. Um, (laughs) And he's like, well, dude, you won't believe this, but when I walked into the locker room that morning, I was so upset that someone was trying to shove that religion stuff down my throat that I threw that Bible in the trash. And he's telling me that he grew up going to church. He grew up part of a youth group. And when he went to college, he turned and walked away from faith, decided to live life on his own terms. So he saw a Bible and he was upset, threw it in the trash. He said he was going out to the practice field that morning, thinking he was the last one in the locker room, and he's pushing the door to go out to the field, and he hears a voice in the back corner of the locker room going, what is this? And he looks back, and there's Mario, our kicker, sitting in his locker, thumbing through the Bible, just kind of muttering to himself, what is this? Now, Taylor, being the punter, and Mario being the kicker, they were best of friends. They spent all their time together, and Taylor screams across the locker room, Mario, come on, man, let's get to practice. And Mario's like, no, 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 what am I supposed to do with this thing? What is this? Taylor's like, Mario, it's a Bible. Let's go. Let's get to practice. And Mario's like, no, Taylor. What am I supposed to do with this thing? So Taylor said in that moment, he felt this nudge on his heart that he needed to go and sit down next to Mario. So he set down his helmet and his pads there at the doorstep, turned around and walked back next to Mario. And he said for the next 45 minutes... He was taking Mario through the Bible, every word written and read are the words of Jesus Christ, the one who died to take on your sins to make you right with God. Now, Taylor hadn't picked up a Bible himself in years. He hadn't been to church in years, but all those seeds that were planted in his life as a kid came out bearing fruit in that moment. And he said it was the weirdest experience because he's sharing all these things. He didn't know where they were coming from. And his friend was just absorbing them. And he said for the rest of that week, Mario couldn't put the Bible down. Every bus ride, every few minutes between meetings and practice, Mario was reading the Bible. And a few days later, a few days after picking up a Bible for the first time in his life, Mario comes up to Taylor and he's like, Taylor, this is real. God is real. What am I supposed to do now? Taylor goes, I I think you just pray. So there in that moment, Mario surrenders his life to Jesus, begins a relationship with God, and then just a few days later, Mario passes away and goes to heaven. Taylor gets the same phone call I did. Hey, did you hear about Mario? And obviously in that same moment of of grief, he's also overcome by the power and the love of God to reach his friend in the final moments of his life right before he'd pass away. So Taylor said in that moment, everything came into crystal clear focus for him. God is real. This is real. And he said he he recommitted his life to Christ in that moment. 
And ever since that moment, when we're reconnecting four years later at that Young Life informational meeting, he's like, yeah, my life hasn't been the same since because I want to tell more people about this. Like, that's why I'm volunteering with this Young Life group. And I'm like, Taylor, that's the craziest story I've ever heard. And it's even crazier because I was the one that put the Bible there. And for all these years, I thought I was a total failure. We gave each other a huge hug. And in that moment, I was obviously reminded of God's incredible purpose for us, even when we can't see the results. There's a verse in the back of the Old Testament from a tiny little book called Habakkuk. Chapter 1, verse 5, it says, Look at the nations and watch. Be utterly amazed. For I'm doing something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. Now, if God would have told me ahead of time, all this stuff's going to happen, I wouldn't have believed him. This is too crazy. Be utterly amazed at what God wants to do through you because he has incredible purposes for each of you. Now, three quick takeaways from this story as we wrap up this time together. Number one is your presence is your purpose. God has you exactly where he wants you. No matter what office you find yourself in, what school you go to, what team you're on, what neighborhood you're in, even what family you're a part of, God has a purpose for you right there. Just like God put me on that team for a purpose, just like he put Taylor and Mario on that team for a purpose, that stretches on to this moment in this room today. Your presence is your purpose. Number two, God whispers through nudges. It's more often than not, it's not going to be the audible voice of God. But it will be those gentle nudges on your heart and your mind and your soul. Just nudging you along to the incredible purpose that God has for you. So it's just like God nudged my heart to try to start a Bible study in a prayer group and put Bibles in my teammates' lockers. Just like God nudged Taylor's heart to set down his helmet and his pads there turn around and walk back and sit down next to his teammate, just like God nudged Mario's heart to pick up this Bible and open it up for the first time in his life. God whispers through nudges. And point number three, just take the next step. We walk by faith, not by sight. So we just take the next step. God's not asking us to to jump 100 miles. He's just asking us to take that very next little step. So whatever nudge you're feeling, whatever it may be right now, he's just saying, just take the next step. And that next step turns into courageous faith. Just take the next step. Just like God empowered me to take my next steps all along that journey. Just like God empowered Taylor to take the next step and walk back, sit down next to his friend. Just like God empowered Mario to take the next step in his relationship with God. Just take the next step. Something is probably stern in your heart right now. God is knocking on the door of your heart. He's nudging you. That is the gift of faith. Now we get to take that next step together, wherever you're at in life. Just keep taking that next step. And watch that tiny little seed of faith right now in this moment turn into an amazing story of courageous faith in your life. Let us pray. With everyone's eyes closed, head bowed, and if you feel comfortable with your palms open, God, we we respond to you now. God, we sense you moving in this room in our hearts. We know that you are here, that you love us. And some of us are are feeling connected to a character in that story right now, Lord. Perhaps you're having a me moment right now. Maybe you're discouraged. Maybe you're defeated. And you're feeling a nudge right now that you need to take a next step. Maybe you just need that encouragement from God. And if you're feeling that, if you're resonating with that, would you lift up your hand to God right now? Say, yes, God, I need you. I need encouragement right now. God sees you. When you respond outwardly to what's happening inwardly, something solidifies in your soul. God sees you all across this room, no matter where you're watching from right now, God sees you. Now maybe you're having a Taylor moment right now. Maybe you resonate with that Taylor character. Maybe you've walked away from God. 
but you're feeling a nudge on your heart that your next step is just to turn back to him. And if that's you, would you raise your hand to God right now? God sees you, God sees you, God sees you, wow. And maybe you're having a Mario moment right now. Maybe you've never really picked this up before. Maybe this is all new to you, but you're feeling a nudge on your heart right now to open yourself up to God. And if that's you, with everyone's eyes closed, just lift up your hand to God. God sees you, God sees you, God sees you. God, we thank you for the purpose that you have for us. We ask that you encourage us and move us on in this journey of courageous faith. We thank you, God. It's your name we pray. Amen.